And I believe we are live. Uh, I'm being joined with special guest, Dr. T. I like to, I like to call him T because I like to think we've got a good rapport at this point. How you doing, Troy? Yeah, everything's good. Very happy to be here. Very, very happy to be here. Tired. Just got back from the gym. Have to go pick up my kid. Have a nice dinner planned, but happy to be here. Now, you did warn me that uh, we, you had kind of a hard start and you had kind of a hard stop. So we will be going about an hour um, and then go ahead and move from there. So let's let's not uh, let's not waste any time. We're going to go into your backstory. Uh, go ahead and tell me a little bit about not only, uh, you know, just briefly in like a paragraph or two, not only a little bit of your backstory, but especially your evolution with uh, your understanding of cholesterol and heart disease, especially. Okay, quick story. <clears throat> I was uh, three years ago, I was 350 pounds. Uh, my wife challenged me to figure out as a physician how to lose weight after struggling my whole life. Uh, and she lit a fire under my butt uh, in a very gentle and kind way. I went to the medical literature and found out basically that everything we were told was a bunch of lies. Um, you know, eating multiple times a day, having fruit juices, et cetera, et cetera. And therein uh, lies the journey going to lower and lower carb. I experimented with um, even lower carb and, and ketogenic athletic performance. And uh, I lost 150 pounds. So that's my personal journey. And where I am in terms of my understanding of cholesterol and where I was, let's say, when I first started practicing. So uh, when I first you know, got board certified in internal medicine, I'd say that my standard approach to uh, dyslipidemia and, and high cholesterol would have been to let's try to lose weight, let's try to uh, exercise. If that doesn't work, you know, let's start a statin. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's probably changed significantly now. Um, so that's kind of where, where we are. Is that, is that enough for you? Or you want yeah. To yeah. No, in fact, actually, um, I kind of mentioned this to you before, but of the guests that I've had on here thus far, uh, I, in my mind, I can consider you almost, uh, a centrist when it comes to like the lipid hypothesis in that you don't, it, like if one side is, you know, LDL is next to irrelevant, doesn't matter at all. The other side is, you know, you should have your LDL as low as you can in, in, in any context, right? Like if that's the two ends of the spectrum. You're, you actually fall pretty close in the middle, which is surprising because most people who know you know you're, you're not exactly uh, Mr. Moderate when it comes to opinions. You can be quite opinionated on some things. Um, and and I and actually that's that's the one thing that I kind of respect a lot about you is because given any day you'll take a contrarian position. Um, a lot of times I think in the way that I do, which is to kind of feel out the strength of the argument that you're making and how much the other side can provide an argument against it. Yeah, look, uh, uh, there's no way that LDL lower all the time makes sense. I think if you take somebody who's anorexic getting you know, chemotherapy and is malnourished and has end stage renal disease and you give them a statin drug, I don't think that they're going to do better. So, so, uh, and each one of those statements has evidence to support it. So this was an evidence-based statement. Okay. Um, now if you take somebody who is the average American who's pre-diabetic, hypertensive and has dyslipidemia and is age, you know, 45, and has the highest chance of dying from a heart attack or stroke, and you give them a statin, well, maybe there's a benefit there. So, so I think that, you know, it's not exactly, you know, it's not an exact science, and, and we know that much now. And we, we know that in the case of, uh, you know, what you call a lean mass hyperresponder, somebody who has no risk factors, is metabolically healthy, and has an otherwise high LDL, and you take them and you put them in a calcium uh, scan, a calcium artery scan, and you get a zero score, and they have no family history. Well, you know, I, the power of zero. I, I think we know now that it's enough to say that maybe a statin isn't beneficial in that case. So, so yeah, I would say that I am a centrist um, in that it's not centrist. It's an evidence-based position. You know, so yeah, I, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I don't think that, you know, as be it's a, it's an, it's the best I can do. 
you know? <laughs> yeah, in fact, in fact, for what it's worth, you have really a lot more backing in just this most recent data, especially with the calcium score, that even people having very high LDL, if they've got a zero calcium score, at least with regard to the addition of statin, there doesn't seem to be as significant of an effect, or at least that was part of the research that Ivor Cummins brought on for us. Yeah, absolutely. The power of zero. You know, if you look up that hashtag, you'll get, you'll, you know, you'll see a lot of discussions on, on calcium score and even, you know, the most recent, uh, uh, ACC meeting, uh, kind of reinforced the use of it, you know, for, for a long time, they've been apprehensive to recommend calcium scores and Steve Nissen, who I've talked to personally about this, uh, about calcium scores was always very, uh, anti-calcium scores. He thinks just, you know, everybody should kind of just take a statin. It's cheap. It's effective. And why do we need an $800 scan? You know, this is exactly his words. Um, so, so, but, but that's slightly changed. And I think the power of zero is, is meaningful in that, you know, everybody doesn't need a statin, you know? And, and so what, one thing that people have to understand is, and researchers will deny this, right. And I've brought this up on several occasions. Um, but pharmaceutical companies, the way they look at, at drug potential is they look at a market and say, how can we widen the market as much as possible, okay, and show an effect. So they want to be able to show an effect on a, as wide of a population as possible, even though let's say like 20% of those people may benefit from the drug, they would rather, and, and the results may be, you know, outstanding, it's in their benefit to, sh to show benefit in, you know, a hundred percent of the population and a modest benefit because then they can give drugs to everybody. So, and, and this may sound nefarious, but I think that deep down inside, you know, trial design is based on this, on this concept, you know, to some extent with preventative I medicine. Uh, I think you're so, I mean, here's what's fascinating is I myself think it could turn out that there actually is this really strong case for statins, much more so than we hear about, ultimately, for the very reason you described, that it could very well be that for, say, 20% of the population, and I'm speaking even primary prevention, right? It could right. be that there's this really strong efficacy, but the problem was that in order to identify that 20%, it means that you likewise identify 80% that not only will not gain a benefit, but that there might actually be a small portion in there that get things worse. And that's why they don't stratify for the things necessarily that I'm, that I'm wanting to look after, such as having the high HDL and low triglycerides. Not saying that that's what's happening, but I'm right. saying that at a minimum, why not look? Why not look and do this you know, deeper stratification? And if it turns out that there is a small por portion of the population that really can see a, a sizable difference, that'll make a big difference because I think a lot of people right now just straight up don't want to take satins. And I know quite a few because the difference in change, even for cardiovascular disease, never mind even all cause mortality, seems so minute that there doesn't seem much of a purpose. So in, in a way, what I'm actually making the argument for is that there really could be something more to say that could really make a case for those people who really are at the higher risk. Yeah, but the, so so look at the way the industry and the current, like so, I'm taking my physician hat off and I'm putting on my you know evil pharmaceutical CEO hat, and so there's no real benefit to any pharmaceutical company who has a wide market to narrow that market, especially when the drugs are generic. So there's no, you know, there's no investment on that. There's no reason to invest on their part, other than you know wasting their resources that they claim they, they, they don't have. So I don't think you'll ever get that data from pharma because anything that narrows their sales potential, you know, it ultimately is a, is a something that'll limit profit. So, so that won't come from pharma. And it's and funny so, you mention luck. that. And it's funny luck. you mention yeah. that because one of the things you said you'd like to talk about is like the CTT, right? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. We can talk about that. Yeah. But in, and as I understand it, the CTT is the um, uh, cholesterol trial tri trialist. I'm sorry, um, the but but effectively they are an organization that pretty much has sort of a, a kind of a legal monopoly on all the existing data with um, especially cholesterol lowering medication trials. Is that about accurate? 
of an yeah, of a way so, of gym. Uh, what was his name? Rory Collins. Rory Collins, right? Uh, uh, from the cholesterol treatment trialists. He said, uh, "Let's figure out. We have so much disparate data from so many different sources on statins. Let's see what if we aggregate this data, what kind of effect, you know, there is or there isn't. Okay, because." In some cases, when we run trials, for example, in the miracle study, you know, for for uh, in in unstable angina or a heart attack, right? If we give statins, we see this effect rather kind of acutely. If we give a statin after a stroke or a TIA, we see an effect rather acutely. And and what's interesting is in those trials, we see an effect like on the the endpoints we're not even tracking. So miracle was looking at unstable angina and stuff like that. And we saw stroke prevention. And then the opposite was true in, in Sparkle, where um, the Sparkle trial was a trial with stroke. And we saw that secondary outcomes of cardiovascular disease were improved. So you have these trials that show benefit in certain, you know, kind of cardiovascular disease. And then you have other trials in primary prevention, like the Jupiter trial that are a big wash. Like it just, there's not a big uh, effect for for statins. And so the question became for the CTT group is, okay, what's, what's real here in primary prevention? Is there a real effect? Can we give statins to everybody? And, you know, there's going to be a benefit, a net benefit. And so what they did was kind of murky. They went to the pharma companies and said, we want your data. And they all said, screw you. And then they're like, okay, well, how about you give us the data and you don't give us, you give us the data on the pro the positive endpoints. You tell us who died and why they died, and then you don't tell us anything else. And yeah. we'll put together this this massive trial. And and I'm sure they sold it in a way that because because the trialists have to agree to give up the data, and the companies have to agree of give up you know agree to give up the data. And so so they have to try to like walk this line between you know, give us the data, we'll make it as good as we look, but at the same time, get the real deal, you know? And so they ended up getting like almost none of the negative data and, and they didn't look at any of really the negative data in terms of, you know, incidents of cancer or, or incidents of, you know, myalgia or well, whatever, you know. And on top of that, I mean, it, virtually every modern trial now also has a run-in period. The run-in period of like you know two weeks for example or something along those lines where they give the drug to everybody helps to alleviate the number of people who might um, otherwise have the symptoms and therefore want to abandon the trial and so forth so there's already a natural lessening effect in the first place um, and and this is what what you're speaking to is unfortunately I think a lot of where cynicism comes from naturally because even if this was paved with good intentions Certainly the cynical view of this is, well, hey, let's go ahead and get together a very uh, large organization that can basically just churn out metadata studies and that, that are all 100% positive towards the efficacy of a cholesterol lowering medication, right? Look, the, the bottom line is what they found was in primary prevention, they weren't able to figure out who benefited and who didn't. Okay, that's that's the bottom line. They viewed it as there's a modest benefit of statin use, and they don't really know who benefits and who doesn't. It looks like everybody benefits. That's what it looks like. It looks like everybody benefits. So that's what the CTG and, group put out. It looks like everybody benefits. That's basically the bottom line. Um, you know. Now, real and, quick. Yeah. Or, sorry. Uh, so to kind of change subjects somewhat, just being mindful of the time. Yeah. You also have some brand new news that's coming out. Uh, in fact, I think you've already shared it with your patrons, and that's your most recent blood work. And I'm, I'm yeah. hoping you'll, I'm you hoping you'll give credit where it's due, <laughs> because you remember when we were first chatting way, way back, and you had 80, 80, 80. You had uh, HDL cholesterol of 80, triglycerides of 80, something and like uh, yeah, really LDL of 80. That. Yeah, and if you that. recall at that time, I haven't taken the time to look it up, but I'll bet you'll remember. I was actually predicting that your LDL would likely climb, right? Yeah, yeah you, I remember you, that. And not 
only that, but when your later test came in, and sure enough, your LDL did climb, I, I want to say to like 115, 120 or something a little bit later. I then said then, I said, I just want to prepare you. It's, it, I think it's just very likely that it may climb further, right? You know, you know what I did that, you know, the first time it, it hit 120, it was close to that 80, 80, 80. I'm looking at them now. And uh, it, it was, it was actually LDL 88, HDL 61. And, can I share my screen? Let me share uh, my yeah, screen. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, uh, uh, screen share. Let me see if I could do an application. Here we go. Okay. You see the, am I bringing it up here? Is it clear? Uh, not abundantly clear. Let me actually see if I can expand my screen a little bit. But go ahead and can read them off when you're looking at, oh, I can see them better now. Yeah, yeah, with the most recent one. Go ahead. So uh, so here's the most recent one. And, and let's go back to here. I think this is when, this was like kind of in the beginning of 2018 or, or the end of 2017. So this is when you started the ketogenic diet. Is that right? No, no, the ketogenic, okay. low carb ketogenic is way back. This is my weight here was 343. Do you see that or not? Uh, really? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. And then uh, these are terrible labs here. And then really it improved within, you know, a year and a half and losing a ton of weight. Um, I was near that 80, 80, 80 kind of uh, mark in July of 2017. And then it, the LDL bumped up. And this was uh, to the end of 2017. And I remember you telling me, hey, it's going to go up more. And I was like, no, I'm going to eat fish. And you wait and see, Dave Feldman. <laughs> and, and I did eat fish. I ate, I, I swapped out fish. I swapped out some, you know, I put in fish. I put in some shrimp. And I like, let's say I went from like four or five days of beef to to two or three days of beef. And and so I swapped out the the a little bit leaner meat and, and some uh you know, some omega-3, and uh, it came down. It came down. I mean, I don't know if that's a real effect, but but that was the intervention here, really. And then this last time around, I went back to beef, more beef, just because I haven't had a chance to buy as much fish and, and seafood as I'd like. been really busy kind of rolling out this practice. And um, more beef and more running. So that's the only two major changes here. Weight's been kind of stable. Uh, and yeah, the, so run, the, the running, LDL, yeah, LDL the running, up, at, so. the running as opposed to weightlifting, right? Like you're not doing as much weight training relative no, pretty, to prior pretty much the same as exact amount of weight training, okay. but, uh, but, but just a lot more running. I had the 5k I was running for, I was preparing for, I'm going to take off screen share. That's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, I, you know, it's funny because I look at the lab, the last lab you showed, and I look at that LDL. And for me, and I realize I live in a very different world than you do. For me, that's like almost like get out of my office numbers. Like it doesn't, it the, the, an LDL of what was it, 147, 149, something like that is not that impressive to me relative to the literature I've already seen, especially including all cause mortality. So let me insert real quick. Um, I have seen lots of studies, and I particularly pay attention to studies with all-cause mortality, to where you can make a case for possibly for men, for there to be a dip in the middle. There's like a U-shaped curve in that you reach kind of this midpoint, and that midpoint tends to be close to that range, around 150s to 180s, something in that neighborhood for LDL cholesterol. Uh, and then it kind of, then the mortality kind of goes up from there. But even ironically, even then it never at the furthest end ends up as high as on the other end with the lowest cholesterol. Those with the lowest cholesterol tends to, tends to be higher. And I know some people will say that's reverse causality, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, I, if there's anything that's definitely changed, I think in a much more distinctive manner, it's that for me, while there can be lots of debate with those numbers that are in say LDL 200 or higher, I just don't feel like there's a lot of debate when you have like 150 LDL, 140 LDL myself. That's just me personally though. Yeah. I mean, in the setting of somebody who's metabolically healthy, so who has a normal waist circumference, who has a normal, um, you know, a, a normal body fat percentage who, who has an, you know, not pre-diabetic or diabetic and not hypertensive or pre-hypertensive and, you know, and has a calcium score of zero or a CIMT of zero, you know. And you have uh, a CIMT of zero? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 
Correct. Yeah. So uh, I just got a new ultrasound. I can't wait to do them. I can't wait to do more of these. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, the butterfly IQ, just so everybody knows, I just bought a butterfly IQ. So everybody knows what this is. It, I'm so excited about it. It's a, it's an ultrasound that hooks up right to your, to your iPhone, hooks up right to the iPhone. So I could bring this. With what? It, I could bring this with me anywhere I want. And it's, so there's three types of ultrasound we call them probes if anybody's listening okay it's the ultrasound device that we use this has three of them in one and it's basically indestructible and whereas they used to be like really you know fragile this is undestructible and um and i just bought it and it's i just can't wait to use it I, every How single one of my it? patients it's two thousand bucks two thousand dollars it's cheap it's cheap i'm gonna have it's to cheap. talk to my wife about what I'm, what I can buy myself for Christmas. Let's see oh, if Santa is in me, a good you're, mood. You're, you're gonna want one of these. There's a huge get, like, there's a huge back order on these. You'll never get it. Oh wow, man, yeah, it's what, like a year, a year wait list. Yeah, but anyway, you can't do you can't do CINTs, can you? Can you do CINTs? Yeah, yeah. You just put it up right up to the, ah. you put it up right to the carotid, and there you go. Ah, so it's, it's so so fine act. You have to measure it. You have to, to so so most ultrasounds. So what happens is, is I wish I could bring up a picture. Maybe I could quickly bring up a picture. But what happens is, is to do a CIMT, for everybody who wants to know what a CIMT is, we basically take an ultrasound, we put it on your neck, okay? And we look at your carotid right. artery. And then, and most ultrasounds nowadays actually automatically calculate the thickness of the artery, the inside part of the artery, the intima, okay? And right. this, so imagine that, this test used to cost, you know, it would cost at least fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to get an ultrasound, um, and a pocket ultrasound used to cost eight thousand. The Philips Lumify or the the um, the uh, GE V Scan, you know, to do this test was expensive. Let's put it that way, and you had to go to a radiologist and you had to get it read and et cetera, et cetera. But now, you know, your primary care doctor can now buy it for let you know two thousand dollars an ultrasound machine and do this test right on you and let you know, hey, you have a serious problem or you don't have a serious problem. So I think that's kind of cool. And if I were you, I would buy one. I'm, I'm like, after this podcast, I'll be, but I almost want to stop this right now. Yeah. So, um, okay. We're going to go ahead and go to the next segment, which is uh, my devil's advocate uh, questions. And uh, I do have a laziness alert. These are the exact same questions from the previous show. Uh, I thought it'd be kind of fun with you. So, who's uh, Devil's Advocate? Question number one. Oh, so these who was the previous show? These are, was that uh, Nadalski? What's the name? No, no, no. It was uh, it was Joel Kahn, actually. Ah, okay. Oh, geez. So, is there any value of any kind to having high levels of LDL particles in the body? And if so, do current studies account for this when looking at disease outcomes? Yes, end stage renal disease, malnutrition, cachexia, and uh, those are the instances where higher LDL is beneficial. Maybe, maybe you'd argue uh, uh, like sepsis or you know, because th there's acute drops in in sepsis and the and and in severe MIs. So the and the more worse, like the shock or the sepsis or the MI, the h higher the drop. So maybe there's a benefit there. I'm not sure. In like the acute illness setting, maybe higher is better. Um, but definitely end stage renal disease, definitely cachexia malnutrition and, uh, uh, probably like, you know, end of life, you know, and, and anybody who's, I say, I'm saying end of life, but any geriatric patient. So any geriatric patient, uh, who's otherwise not at risk for imminent heart disease or stroke. And, and you believe, you believe that person would be, uh, at greater benefit with higher LDL. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, well, let me put it this way. I don't think there's any reason to lower the LDL with pharmacotherapy in a geriatric patient, end stage renal disease patient, or a, um, you know, or somebody with malnutrition, you know, or, or cachexia or any, any of those kind of, you know, somebody, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. Um, anyway, so that's the that's the gist of it. I don't think there's any benefit unless it's like secondary prevention, maybe, but uh, for the most part, no. All right, let's uh, let's go to the second one. 
Is that so, reasonable? Is that reasonable? What did, what did everybody else oh, say? That's what yes, I want to hear. What did uh, Joel Kahn say? Dr. Joel Kahn. Oh, uh, you, you'll have to tune in. His, oh, okay. his video is up. <laughs> uh, many who go on a low-carb, high-fat diet will see their LDL cholesterol go up, but will likewise see their HDL cholesterol climb and their triglycerides drop. You may have heard me talk about this before. <laughs> it is, is it possible this will result in lower-risk cardiovascular disease? Okay, let's compare apples to apples. Same patient, right? Same patient, went low carb, has a high LDL versus same patient, went low carb and has a normal-ish LDL. I truly believe that the that there's dietary ways and diet and exercise, right? And lowering that LDL with diet and exercise. So dietary modifications like just swapping out some SFA for fish and and you know, maybe um, going a little bit leaner on the, <clears throat> going a little bit leaner. You have to understand, I, I look at this from a weight loss perspective. That's kind of the way I do, and I deal with disease. Sure, sure. So for the most part, if we're comparing apples to apples, I'd say s massively elevated LDL is probably worse than, than a nominally elevated or normal LDL. That's actually, that's actually why I have devil's advocate question one preceding devil's Devil's Advocate question two. So yeah. devil, Devil's Advocate question one, you you mentioned a few things. There are, of course, other things. Let's let's even set aside what they are. Let's say I give you a pile of studies that outline all sorts of things. Uh, higher levels of LDL could be protective, such as for infection or recovery from injury or a number of other things. But let's just say I get like a, a pile of those so that it is apples to apples as far as, um, I should say, LDLs to LDLs that those things that we account for for being a benefit in lowering LDL aren't likewise taking into account the other aspects that are associated with the positive outcomes of having higher LDL. Do you think that it could turn out that this is very relevant for, of course, the most important outcome of all, which is longevity? Um, look, I think that the most common reason for death is cardiovascular disease in you know, somebody aged 35 to 65. So I think if you had to look at what, you know, what is somebody going to die from and make an educated guess, it would be cardiovascular disease. So if you're like, okay, <clears throat> am I going to get a couple more, you know, colds versus, you know, am I going to potentially mitigate, you know, uh, atherosclerosis? I think you got to go with that. I think you got to go with atherosclerosis. I, I, I look, I don't feel super strongly about this. I, I, I th I'm not, you know, I'd rather like, I just saw somebody very recently, a low carber who had an LDL of almost 300, right? We did a CAC score and it was zero. And if you compared his labs to before and after low carb, his HDL was improved. His, um, you know, his, his triglycerides were improved. His liver fat was resolved. So what do I say? Do I say that every part of you is metabolically healthier and because of your high LDL, you should go back? You know, no, we got a calcium score. It was zero. Um, so Let, let's, what, let's do I, follow it. what do I do? So now do I tell him? So my advice to him was, I think whatever you're doing is better than before. And I think that, you know, maybe trying to swap out some of the, the you know, the, um, ruminant fat, you know, the saturated fat for omega-3 is probably helpful, you know, so that, so that was my advice. So I don't know if that so makes let's, sense let's, of how I, how, does that like give the nuance of, you know, yeah, answering yeah, yeah. question? This, this is what I usually say myself for those people in particular, if they're watching, uh, cause what you're, what you're talking about is commonly if somebody has an LDL of 300 and they're metabolically healthy, and they're low carb, they are a lean mass hyperresponder. They'll also have very high HDL, they'll have very low LDL, or sorry, uh, very low triglycerides. Now, what I actually now give as advice more than the other advice is if they want to truly drop it down to doctor being happy levels, usually they have to leave keto. They may be able to stay low carb, but basically they probably can get those numbers by swapping out fat and swapping in carbs. The PUFAs can be, can impact the numbers a lot, but I tend to find that it does tend to be very individualized. 
And it does depend on what level of quantity you go in. So if you're very, very low carb, you usually have to, uh, Peter Atia had a case that he talks about that's like this where guys practically just chugging it. And that's the way in which he was able to get it down that low. I myself, I tend to lean towards, I would, I would almost rather, I mean, omega threes, fatty, particularly from real food sources. Sure. That sounds great. But I, I'd be willing to bet that that guy who has it at 300 and at very low carb, if he just went with a lot more, you know, fish, it's not, it's not going to say bring his LDL to like 120. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not expecting it to drop. Uh, that significantly. I mean, I'd be surprised if it dropped 50 or 75 points. I mean, you've done this enough to show it takes a lot to drop it 150 points. Uh, what was it? Wonder it, Bread? I've also and, kind of uh, shown what, that it doesn't it? take a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonder the Bread Wonder Bread. And, and that uh, was in, <laughs> and, uh, and, and lean processed meat. One yeah. of my least favorite experiments I ever did. But as far as you know, results. Yeah. I, I dropped, I dropped my LDL by two thirds in seven days. Uh, I dropped it by 213 milligrams per deciliter, you know, uh, faster. I, so, so let's like, look at it from a dietary perspective. All right. Let's say we go from zero carb to 50 grams, of, you know, 50 grams of carbohydrates with, from nuts and berries. Okay. And let's say mm -hmm. we cut, cut out the strict animal fat you know, the heavy bacon and, and animal fat that this particular patient was eating. And we, we swap in, uh, some fish and some leaner meat. So maybe one day of chicken, you know, one day of salmon and one day of shrimp instead of, you know, seven days of beef and lamb and bacon, uh, and pork. So, you know, what happens if we make, you know, some of these changes and I don't think that his, you know, I don't think he'll go out of ketosis. I don't think, and I don't, believe that it'll necessarily make him any less healthy. And I think that it'll probably improve his lipids. And so, so that would be the kind of advice I would give. Yeah, yeah that that's would be the kind of advice I'd give. And I'd say exercise. And then this is why it's kind of fun to walk down this road with a lot of people, because you definitely coming from a place of experience to know that, yeah, the very things you mentioned could ultimately have that impact, right? For that matter, Doing things like weightlifting uh, per my resistance training experiment, you know, I was able to bring down my LDL, keeping all other things exactly the same. But did weightlifting bringing down my LDL improve my cardiovascular risk factors strictly by the reduction of LDL, or was it actually just you know getting more exercise anyway was possibly an improvement? the The larger question I'm driving at is if it turns out that really these changes that we're making are changing the metabolic pathway in the same way that I'm demonstrating it with a terrible diet by just doing white bread and processed meat, then again, are we changing, are we chasing shadows? Like that's all the more reason why it'd be great if we just had more data on healthy metabolic lipid systems. You won't get it. Against having 12, high levels less, of LDL. Less than 12, first of all, less than 12% of the United States is healthy metabolically. So and then who's interested in testing and doing research on people that can't get a drug, you know? So, so good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Fair I'm enough. So, uh, let's, we're going to see if we can go ahead and take some questions before we wrap up. So um, we'll talk for a moment longer, but I'm going to go ahead and have uh, Siobhan start collecting questions in the chat. Anybody wants to ask a question of uh, Dr. T or myself, just go ahead and hashtag uh, cholesterol science, if you would. And she'll start going ahead and feeding them to me across the Slack channel. So, is there any way I can see them, or I just gotta patiently wait? Uh, you, oh, you there's a chat. There, I see it. Yeah, okay. there's a chat. You can, if you want to, you can actually just take some questions straight from there yourself if you'd like to. Um, but the way, uh, what I think may be happening is you may be looking at the chat in our window. Yeah, and it doesn't oh. actually work that way. You have to actually look at it. It's an annoying thing with YouTube. It seems like you have to do it from inside of their. YouTube. Um, Got it. Okay. Like has a separate window right ah, now. All right. And actually it looks as if uh, Siobhan's feeding me something already. So Jim D asks, how do we prevent becoming glucose resistant slash insulin resistant after being on IF keto for so long? My fasting insulin is drifting up now after six months of five times OMAD keto. Do we need to cycle it up to stay seasonal? Uh, sorry, cycle it up to stay seasonal dual fuel. 
Yeah, I get his question. He's talking about metabolic flexibility. Oh, T, I can't hear you right now. I'm wondering if they can't hear you either. Did your mic go can, off? Can you hear me? Oh. Oh. I don't know if you guys can hear T. Can you guys uh, hear me? For some reason, I can't now hear him. Can you hear me? Siobhan, are we able to hear T? I'm not sure if anybody else can hear him right now. I hope I'm not talking over him, but I can't can you hear, hear him me? on my end. Can you hear me? No. Wait. Oh, apparently they can hear you. So it's something on my end. Sorry. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Go ahead and answer T. Uh, okay. So the question was about metabolic flexibility. Yeah. So I'm happy to, to answer that. Basically the question is, okay, I'm becoming quote unquote physiologically insulin resistant and you're seeing a slight drift in your fasting uh, glucose. I don't really think that you, you have to worry about that. If you cared about the numbers, or well, it really matters, I guess, where you are. If you care about uh, the number one thing you can do to increase your insulin sensitivity is exercise. So exercise would be my first uh, point for you to, to consider. Uh, and this is not medical advice, by the way. It's uh, just um, kind of general advice. The best way to get ins the best way to get insulin sensitive. The best way to get insulin sorry insulin sensitive is to exercise. So can you periodically refeed carbs and do carb night? Uh, you could, uh, and that may improve your, your carbohydrate oxidation. I'm not convinced that it'll help really with anything other than make numbers look good. So I don't know if that answers that question. Can you hear me yet, Dave? Yeah, I can, I can hear you now. I actually, oh. I don't know if it's the, the headphones went out or not. Uh, so I've got the next question queued. Uh, K Zin asks, what are your thoughts about the insulin glucagon ratio and do you track them? Uh, insulin glucagon. I, I never really test for glucagon. Uh, it's, it, it, I watched Ben Bickman's uh, lecture. He had a great lecture on kind of the effects of, uh, he goes into the science between uh, behind why we really don't need to care about protein uh, amount in a low carb state. If we're considering um, if we're considering, you know, not for like seizures and mood and stuff like that, but if we're considering, you know, weight loss and, and, uh, just being in ketosis. So it's an interesting idea and concept. I don't think clinically it has an impact. I don't, I don't need to track glucagon. Uh, so that's my answer on that. I can add a little bit to that. I have been testing for glucagon. Okay. Um, and probably the reason you're not ordering it is the reason I wasn't, which is that it's in stupidly expensive. Um, I, I finally got them to give me a little bit of a break on the price, but it's really ridiculous. It was the most expensive, the most expensive marker I was getting from before. Here's the fascinating news. Um, all but one of them were, were roughly flat. Like surprisingly, I'd gotten this over my weight gain experiment. I'd gotten this over my white bread and processed meat experiment. And it's almost always in the mid sixties to lower seventies. I forget the unit of measurement, but um, it didn't matter if my insulin was high or low or so forth. And I wonder if it's reflective of uh, metabolic flexibility that maybe I'm metabolically flexible enough that I can still maintain a certain degree of uh, glucagon dominance as uh, Eve would say, for example. Um, okay. Let's go and move to the next question. Sean asks, what is the cause of heart disease? Uh, there's multiple causes. Tobacco causes it. <clears throat> Stress can cause it. Uh, hypercoagulability can cause it. It's a tough, you know, what's the cause in, in, I think it's the modern diet and lifestyle, right? I think that has to be the cause of it. So, you know, everything. So yeah. Sorry. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. Even as I was reading that, I was like, oh, what a, what a pain in the butt. Like that's, that's a tough question to answer because certainly almost everybody who gets deep into it will concede that it's multifactorial. Um, and I don't know that there's anybody, I don't know that there's anybody who says there's one origination. There's, there's one, um, initiating factor to heart disease end of discussion. Uh, it now I forgot inflammation. Inflammation is definitely a part of all this. So probably yes, makes everything. Uh, so bid now says, the self-reported triglyceride readings on Reddit keto for people in significant fat loss mode is generally over 100. 
After three months at maintenance, this tends to lower to 100 or perhaps even lower. Oh, sorry, this was, I guess, just a comment. Um, Siobhan says, Tro, does this reflect what you see in your own practice? Everybody in my practice has a who's who's on a low carb diet has a triglyceride less than 100. I can't. Yes. Even, so, yeah. Thumbs up. I if I can just if I can just throw in, there's probably there are three markers that I look to before all others, and that's not as to say that these are the only three markers you ever look at. But the three markers I care about the most are fasting insulin, triglycerides, and hsCRP. And a lot of times, mainly because those unfold into bigger like let's find out more thing and they're, they're good. You know, let's find out more markers in many respects, uh, but triglycerides, I mean, to me is just absolutely the most important marker on a lipid panel bar none for me. Um, I think I actually ran through the existing questions we had. I want to actually, um, I want to mention one more thing before we wrap up here shortly. One of the, one of the things I've got to give you a lot of credit for is you've helped to identify, and you talk about a lot on Twitter, um, the phenomenon of doctor burnout, that a lot of medical professionals, especially doctors, get very far down the road of getting into the practice and doing a lot of what they're doing, and they they start out in you know, a much more of a positive place, and then unfortunately, they're, they don't really have the opportunity to do a lateral move in their career quite to the same extent. And this, this can be a part of the larger problem, especially if you've got a very heavy bureaucratic system that they're now working within that they couldn't quite as easily uh, understand would need to be navigated in the future. Would that be an accurate way of summarizing what you've, what you've helped to bring to light? What, what's happening now in medicine is, is absolutely terrible for physician autonomy. And there may be, I mean, it goes through this swings, right? There was the HMO in the 90s, and then it was like a crawl back of the private practice. And now it's like the hospital systems coming in. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, loss of physician autonomy. You know, most new physicians are either becoming a hospitalist or joining a hospital group uh, or a multi-specialty group. Um and there's a less and less doctors going into private practice. And the problem with this is not anything per se, but some of these groups can be excellent. I mean, I work in the Yale system and I've never seen a group that strives for more uh, excellence, you know, especially at the hospital that I uh, moonlight at and work at at Greenwich Hospital. I mean, it's a, just a, a strive for excellence in every regard. And there is no, you know, um, there is no loss of physician autonomy and that physician independence, even within the hospital system is maintained. But, you know, contrast that to my previous employer where I had seven managers. I had, you know, a CEO, a CFO, a scheduling manager, an IT manager, a, a marketing manager, a, and they, and to the point where they literally came to me and said, well, you know, I would really like it if you referred to GI doctors who, you know, did colonoscopies in our hospital. And we'd really like it if you referred to physicians that admit to our hospital and, you know, irrespective of where the patients lived or, um, and so, you know, not only that, they, you know, well, you know, they said, well, we'd really like it if you stopped admitting your patients to the hospital and use the hospital as service. But I know my patients. Why would I let another doctor take care of them, you know, in the hospital? So, um, you know, what people don't understand is that there's a lot of pressures on physicians and, and, uh, and it comes from, you know, places, uh, that you wouldn't expect. And, and it comes from employers and this employed model. So I'm, I'm, I've left that model because I don't want to be a crappy doctor. I don't want to be forced to make, you know, decisions that, that, um, I don't agree with and, I don't want to, you know, order a DEXA scan just because the hospital says it's due and they want to make money off of the imaging in the labs. So, so I left that previous employer, um, you know, which is a, a, a large hospital in the New Jersey area, one of the largest. And, uh, you know, I've since, you know, worked at, a, at in this Greenwich and Yale system. And, you know, about one and a half years ago, I started doing online consultations because, you know, I wanted more fulfillment and this is what I like doing. And, and now I'm opening up my own practice and people, you know, somebody wrote a comment to me earlier today saying, you know, 
you're just a doctor selling a program, you know, you, you know, I can't trust you. You know, somebody wrote that on Twitter and look, you know, I took out a huge loan to make this practice happen. I'm, I'm, you know, borrowing money to do this. You know, I could just sit back in my comfortable, you know, academic hospital job and not do this, but you know, I'm very passionate about it. So I'm putting my own money into this and people don't realize that, that it's a big risk to be an autonomous doctor and to get out of that cycle of burnout, so to speak. Go you know, make a, congr I mean, uh, let me be one vote toward you on uh, make an absolute congratulations to that. I, I, I have myself, I've started and ran many businesses. The last one went really well, which is why I was able to have the nest egg that I did to do a lot of the research that I'm doing right now. But I really don't think people understand just how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. And when it comes down to what you're talking about, this it's extremely relevant that people get this is yes, at the end of the day, these things are businesses. And yes, as you said, they're, they're not all operating this way, but yeah, some are going to say, Hey, we would like more use out of this equipment that we've invested in or, or more to supply to, you know, these people who, who and, and they may even be in, of the opinion that this is going to be helpful to patients in the end, but by the same token, yeah, I would like to go to a functional doctor who would maybe have a concierge service where it would cost me a lot of money to use their brain to keep me from having drugs or to keep me from getting needless tests and so forth because they're going to put more effort into it. But that that's not going to be the doctor who has just 10 minutes when he walks in the room to turn me back around again because he's got another eight people on the floor that he's got to hit before his lunch hour. You know what I mean? Yeah, look, I I, uh, I completely know what you mean. Every new patient of mine gets a 90-minute evaluation. I don't know when the last time you spent 90 minutes with your doctor. That's, that's fantastic. And, uh, so every new patient gets 90 minutes. Every patient has my cell phone. They can text me. Every patient of mine has can email me. You know, I, I coordinate with, you know, I've done incredible coordination above and beyond uh, what you'd expect. And I like it this way. I like doing my best and I like my patients knowing that I'm doing my best and I feel better this way. I wish somebody can come and just take away the business side of being a doctor from me. I would love it if somebody came to me and said, I'm going to do your marketing. I'm going to do your phone calls. I'm going to do everything, the bills and all that. I despise nothing more than this, than being a business owner. I hate it. I hate it. It's, it's fun and interesting, but it's, it's like, this all takes me away from what I want to do, which is help people. So if somebody came to me and sounds like you're not working right now, so Dave, you can come help me. Um, <laughs> and so what you can do is just help me do this and, and get this open so I can help more people and spend time with them. Um, and the problem is, is, you know, look, I got student loans, I got a mortgage and, 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 you know, I, I, so I'm working, a f you know, almost full time at the hospital as I build this practice and build out this, uh, uh, uh vision I have for, for primary care. So, uh, please, if somebody's out there and wants to help me, please help me because I can't stand money and I can't stand being a business owner and I just want to help people and free me from this crap. Well, yeah. for, for what it's worth, I'm at a minimum, I'm, I'm on the other side where I'm talking to family and friends and including a lot of people who follow us is I, I put a lot of effort towards saying, if you don't like your doctor, if you feel like your doctor is a little too much of a cog in a machine, you don't get enough time to talk to them about your needs and your goals and so forth. Trust me, it's worth taking a little more money and putting it towards a more personalized service because it's your health. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like an ad for you in particular. I'm just an ad for overall benefit of proactively taking more ownership. And part of taking ownership of your health isn't just coming to understand it more for yourself, but it's also investing in somebody who is an expert who can help better understand that for you. And like I said, you're, ju you're just not going to get that with anybody who spends just minutes at a time looking just at blood work and seeing what's in range and out of range and then prescribing something Let on top of that. I, I probably <laughs> save more money than I cost. If you have type one diabetes or, or diabetes and you're on insulin, you know, you're paying a huge amount. 
I mean, I don't think I've had a patient on insulin yet that I've costed more than I've saved them, you know, uh, because of the cost of insulin. Um, so, so, you know, the, the, and I'm, to be honest, I, I do my best to, to keep my rates low. You know, I, 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 I hate money, man. I hate, like, I hate that I have to think about this as a physician. You know, I really hate that I have to think about this as a physician. So, uh, but to be honest, if, if I was like a diabetic or, or, you know, you're going to save money, you're going to save money because you're going to come off medications. Uh, yeah. And that's why, that's what Verda is doing. Verda, I mean, it's not like I'm saying something so crazy. Verda has made a guarantee to insurers and employers that they will not collect money that they don't save. So, I mean, it, this is like, this is not like some crazy talk. I'm not some charlatan. Okay. This is, you know, some massive company with, you know, hundreds of patients who is making the same claim. I'm not, you know, people say like, oh, be careful of, you know, promises and, and guarantees. It's not a guarantee. I mean, they're, you know, this is what we do. You know, we get people off insulin. Um, yeah, that's, that's, anyway. not, that's not to be understated at all. We're going to have to wrap up here in a sec real quick. How do people reach you? Oh, uh, just, you can visit my Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, Dr. Tro. Uh, you can go to my website, D O C T O R Tro T R O.com. So it's Dr. Tro spelled out.com. And you can reach me or just, uh, just, you know, tweet me. Absolutely. Real quick rolling credits. This was produced by Siobhan Huggins and I'm your host, Dave Feldman. And of course, Thank you to um, the wonderful patrons that actually make this happen. I want to one last time thank you, T, for coming on. And uh, this was fantastic. Got to really hit a lot of good stuff today. Yeah, hopefully I'll see you. Uh, you're going to be lecturing at Denver, right? So I'll be, I'll be seeing you oh, yeah. there. I'll be seeing you there. Yeah. All right. You have a good weekend. You can buy me a steak since you're such a wealthy I, entrepreneur. I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not wealthy, but yeah, I could buy you a steak. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. We'll see you later. All right. Bye.